Kära publik i audience. Maybe you agree with me when I say that it seems as if we've been denied a proper Scandinavian winter. That last year's fall almost seamlessly transformed into an early and rather chilly spring. But no chilliness can be traced in my voice when I exclaim that it's high time to officially open the doors to the spring season 2020 at International Writers' Stage. That's rather great. My name is Ingmar Fast. I'm Artistic Director of Literary Events at Kulturhuset Stadstheatern. You know that um, gigantic haven of the arts by Sager Square, which is temporarily closed down. Renovation, renovation. But the good news is, and some of you may know about this already, is that we have entered into a very fruitful collaboration with the Stockholm School of Economics. And that's why we're here in this, at, at this particular venue, in this particular and beautiful lecture hall this evening in late January. And I especially want to thank our collaborator here at this school, postdoc fellow, Mr. Erik Wikberg. Where are you? You're seated somewhere. He's... Good, good. And I also do hope that the beautiful, some beautiful music seeped into your heads while you entered into this venue. Um, music executed by Louise Lindberg, Louise Hedberg, I'm sorry. And she played on a grand piano. But it's not just a grand piano. It was once in the ownership of the late Ingmar Bergman. And so it happens that it entered up here at the Stockholm School of, Ent of Economics. It happens now and then, but not too often, that you read a debut novel which completely refuses to leave you, to desert you, even long after you're having finished the very last sentence. It's as if it's, in a way, glued to your mind. And that's what happened to me after having read Sympathisören. The Sympathizer. And uh, it's by this evening's guest of honor, as you all know. And when during this past Christmas break, I re-entered into this particular author's literary territory and read his collection of short stories, Flüchtinger, The Refugees, it all happened again. Over and over again, story by story, my mind both invaded and affected as well as my heart. These two extraordinary works of fiction are published in Sweden and in Swedish by Tronan Publishing House. And they are translated by Mr. Hans Berggren. And since he resides across the big ocean in Brazil, we have to deliver one hell of applause so that, so that he can feel the sound waves across the ocean. And please do that now, because his achievement is remarkable, actually. Hans Bergen. Now he nods somewhere, quite satisfied with himself. And the second applause, I have to say, belongs to Another master, a, a master graphic designer, Mr. Håkan Liljemark, and you're here tonight, and I want you to raise, because you have created this, this masterpieces, and you have created so many covers for so many uh, Swedish publishing houses. And where are you? There you are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's blushing now, and that's good. And this evening you meet our guest of honor in conversation with Andreas Norman, author and former diplomat. And before we allow them to enter this podium, I would like to ex express my deep gratitude towards Uppsala University. And how come, you may ask. And that question, I think it will be answered during the next hour. That said, please welcome from Los Angeles and accompanied by Mr. Norman, Vietan Yuan. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Yes. 
So, lovely to see so many people who have come this evening. And uh, I'm so happy to sit here with you, Viet. It's, uh, it's an honor. And I mean, after reading your books, there are so many thoughts that, uh, that sort of bubbled inside me for, for the last weeks um, about refugees, about Vietnam, about things I never sort of thought about also as well. Um, I, may, I might just start by summarizing uh, what uh, Flick Dinger, the, um, the refugees, um, uh, it's, it's a, eight short stories, perhaps you haven't read it yet. If you haven't, you, I implore you to, to, to buy the books and, and read them, because it's a, it's a collection of crisp prose, of beautifully written prose that is timely, and I would call it an uh, antidote to Trump policies in many ways. Uh, it really gives you uh, an inside view of uh, the issues of being a refugee and everything that comes with it. Uh, stories from uh, ghosts on uh, ghosts of boat refugees who are killed in a pirate attack, to uh, stories of the double nest that lies inherent in in the refugee experience, uh, uh, such as in the short story um, uh, Fatherland, where where uh, a, a man decides uh, to give the names of his his older children to his younger children, and in a way, many ways you um, you you create uh, images of this doubleness and so on. How is it to to write the refugees? Well, thanks so much for being here in conversation with me, Andreas. You know, I know that you're a writer, former diplomat in counterterrorism uh, official. And so I really look forward to our conversation about all those kinds of things, about politics and mm -hmm. spycraft and, and crime uh, mm -hmm. later on. But, um, you know, I came as a refugee to the United States uh, in 1975, and I grew up in San Jose, California, mm -hmm. with a very interesting experience, which is that I grew up in a Vietnamese household that was completely Vietnamese. My parents only spoke Vietnamese. We ate Vietnamese food. We only had friends with Vietnamese people. And so I grew up, though, feeling like an American. Mm. So my childhood was spent feeling like I was an American spying on my parents. Mm. And then when I stepped outside of my parents' house, I was in the rest of the United States, and I felt like a Vietnamese spying on Americans. And so I always grew up with this sense of doubleness, with this sense of duality, of always feeling like a spy no matter where I was. Mm. And so that translated into becoming a writer, mm. uh, because I think maybe you would agree, you know, a writer is always a spy. Yeah. We're always observing, yeah. we're always Absolutely. looking at you, stealing information from you, ready to mm. betray you. Uh, and that actually was sort of the basis of Fatherland, the story that you mentioned. I, I met a woman, a Vietnamese American woman, and she said, well, you know, my family's story is that my father uh, had gone to re-education. Mm. And my mother discovered that he had an affair and so she decided to flee the country with his three children. And then when he got out of re-education, he found himself alone in Vietnam, and he had married another woman, had three children, and named them after the first set of children. So that's a true story, but I took that story from her, and I put it into the book. It's a bit haunting, and yet you can understand, you can sympathize to some extent with that decision, it's sort of keeping memory alive, or, or what was this man doing, you think? Well, that's what we're supposed to do as, as spies and as writers mm. is to try to get into people's mindsets and why do people make these strange decisions. Mm. And in fact, all of us make strange decisions all the time, uh, especially if we're under conditions of great you know, historical and personal pressure. So I grew up in this Vietnamese refugee community of mm. tens of thousands of Vietnamese people. And when I heard this story, I was both struck by it, that it was a really good story that I could steal, but also I was completely not surprised by it because the refugee community was full of stories of people doing things like this, uh, of, of having lost everything, of having lost their country, of having lost their family or their relatives, and uh, doing all kinds of behaviors 
that would have very complicated effects. So this particular man had cheated on his wife, had had a you know, and 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 uh, decided to do this bizarre act of naming his children after these other children. And I thought, I've I've seen people like him mm. before. Mm. And growing up among refugees, I knew two things. One, I knew that they were completely human. And then I also knew that they they also many of them also did completely regrettable things mm. at the same time. So I had mm. deep empathy mm. for them, just as I had for the America, the rest of the Americans that I was growing up among. Mm. You know, my, my you 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 mentioned, for example, that this the sympath the refugees is a, sort of an antidote for Trumpian America. Mm. Uh, but in fact, I think the appearance of Trump is simply a manifestation of something that was already there sure. in the United mm. States. Mm since its very beginning, and certainly since I was uh, an American. Mm. And so I grew up in the United States, besides feeling constantly doubled at home and in my personal life, mm. feeling doubled as a part of the entire country, because I grew up feeling like an American, mm. uh, that the stories that I read, the, the, the TV and the films that I, that I watched, I identified with because I was an American. Yeah, yeah. You, you fled with your family 1975 from Saigon. Right. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that journey? You came then to, to America uh, and grew up. You were four years old four years at the old. time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so your parents and your brother and you come to this country that actually waged war on mm -hmm. Vietnam for, for many years. Right. Um, could you tell us about what it meant to you to, to come to, to America and also the, the sort of circumstance that you, you landed in? Well, when I was four years old, it didn't mean anything to me. No. Uh, but <laughs> by the time I was 10 or 11 or 12 mm. and watching American movies about the Vietnam War and realizing that, mm. in fact, Americans did not see us mm. as Americans, or at least me, mm. they saw Vietnamese people simply as faceless objects mm. to be killed or to be pitied. And that, that was a devastating realization for mm. me to understand that, in, that no matter how American I felt, there was a large part of the American population that would never mm. see me that way. That's mm. part of the Trumpian America. Mm. But at, at, at four years of age, when I came to the United States, what was very interesting about that was that 130,000 of us came to the United States because the Americans had fought alongside of us. The majority of Americans actually did not want to accept Vietnamese refugees mm. at this time. It was really only be, by act of the U.S. Congress that we were taken in. Uh, and so I, I go around saying this all the time to try to remind people that now, 50 years later, Americans generally are very happy to have Vietnamese Americans among their population because we do their nails. Uh, we have become their doctors. My you brother's a books. doctor, for example. We write books, etc. <laughs> mm -hmm. But 40 or 45 years ago, we were the people that Americans were scared of. So you would say the perceptions have, have changed? Or are they just transformed in uh, both. Mm. You know, the perceptions have changed because we're no longer the newest foreigners. Mm. So now there are newer foreigners that Americans are scared of. So mm. the, the, the pattern repeats itself, which is why for those of us who were once the people that Americans were scared of, it's up to us to remind Americans that, yes, we were once refugees and now we are Americans too. Mm. There's no reason to believe that new refugees won't repeat the same process. Mm. But we came and we were resettled in a refugee camp in Pennsylvania. My first memories begin in that refugee camp. Mm. Uh, to leave one of these refugee camps, we refugees had to have sponsors to um, make sure that we integrated into American society. And sponsors meaning? Amer other Americans. A, a, an American, American yeah. a truly American family. A truly American family <laughs> who, would, who would take care of us. Well, there, there was no American family who was willing to take my entire family, which was my parents, my 10-year-old brother, and me. Mm. And so we were split up, and I was sent to live with a, an American sponsor family, which, when you're four years old, makes completely no sense. Mm. To me, I felt like I was being abandoned. And so my earliest memories are of howling and screaming as I'm being taken yeah, away from my parents. That's a traumatic experience for a four-year-old. Very traumatic yeah. experience uh, for a four-year-old. Mm. So I was not capable of understanding, obviously, that this was being done in order to help my parents uh, find the time to, to establish themselves mm. in the United States. So this is my origin story as an American, mm. Mm. right? To be both the uh, welcomed into this country, if reluctantly, by Americans, and then also to be separated from my family traumatically mm. as part of that same policy. Mm. 
Um, and so now, of course, in the United States, we are undergoing all kinds of controversies about immigration, about refugees. Mm -hmm. And we, I, I say we because I think we're all collectively responsible, separating families at mm -hmm. the southern border of the United States, taking children away from their, their parents, hundreds, mm -hmm. thousands of children, and losing them or, or keeping them separated for very mm -hmm. long amounts of time. Uh, these are devastating Mm. traumatic experiences yeah. for both the children and the parents, and it's mm. wrong. Mm. And so I, I think it's an obligation for all of us who have been refugees to say again that it is wrong to treat people this mm. way. We may have our debates about re re refugees and immigration, but we shouldn't be having debates about humanity and morality and how, mm. to, how to treat people. Um, so I, I, I look at my experience, which mm. was actually not that bad because I was separated mm. from my parents for about three months, and then brought back Then re reunited. Them. Yeah, reunited. Okay. Okay. But nevertheless, that, that experience has left its imprint on me that I have never <laughs> forgotten, hmm. even though I've tried my best to forget it. And it's that tension between never forgetting a trauma and then trying to, you know, and then going back to it that, that made me into a writer. Hmm. And, I, you know, so, so all I'm saying is it wasn't all bad being a refugee. Being a refugee gave me the necessary emotional damage to become a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, it, was it Graham Greene that ever, who said that everything lies in the childhood? Yeah. And and a good writer should have a troubled childhood. Right. I don't know if it's Graham Greene. Uh, I think it was. Well, you know, I grew up. I I, when I, I wanted to be a writer when I was mm. young, and I remember reading an article uh, in a newspaper. It wasn't mm. by Graham Greene, but it was saying the same thing that if you look at writers, they've all they're all basically screwed up people. <laughs> And I was uh, 12 years old, and I thought, I'm not screwed up. That means I can't become a writer. But in fact, I was much more screwed up emotionally mm -hmm. than I realized. And mm -hmm. part of my way of coping um, mm -hmm. with what had happened to my family and to me and all the things that would happen after mm -hmm. we came to the United States was to not think right. about those experiences, was to not feel. Mm -hmm. So to become numb to the trauma and to the pain that I could see my fellow refugees going yeah. through, yeah. the difficulties that I saw my parents going through. My parents were successful in mm. Vietnam, but they lost almost everything coming to the United States as refugees. So then they had to start all over again, and they had to become shopkeepers and work 12 to 14 mm. hour days almost every day of the year and get shot in their store on Christmas Eve. And I, you know, all this Which was is a part in, of my in childhood. Which is, in a way, it's the, it's the sort of uh, classic uh, story of the hardworking refugee creating their own success right and I, and as a writer i was very aware of that because mm -hmm. i'm also a scholar of american literature so mm -hmm. I, I know about this american dream hard-working immigrant success story mm -hmm. uh and the refugees i think can fall under that idea mm -hmm. and so americans are perfectly aware that to become american is very difficult americans are aware that refugees and immigrants have to undergo all these struggles but their great reward is that they get to become americans they get to fulfill the American dream, and pain is just a part of that experience. And the ultimate proof of that when it comes to literature is the fact that people like me can write books like mm. The Refugees. Mm. And so as a writer, how do I overcome that way of framing mm. the story? The, yeah. the, Americans completely believe in the American dream. This yeah. is our religion. Yeah. Anything that doesn't fit our religion, we refuse to think about it. So the, the sympathizer is my attempt to mm. prevent my work from being read in that way, yeah. because the sympathizer, one part of it, is a very direct attack on the American dream and on American exceptionalism. Yeah, exactly, and and it's really a corrective to to the whole narrative of of the Vietnam War. War, um, sort of, uh, it crushes the, the sort of cliched American narrative of of the of the war, um, but also thinking. Um, I mean, you have em emphasized many times that you're a refugee, not an immigrant. And I think that's a very interesting and, and important notion uh, that, that the difference, which is not only legal, and so, is, is also in relation to the American dream, right? So if you're a refugee, you're someone else in relation to the American dream, uh, rather than, I mean, if you're an immigrant. Right, so immigrants are definitely a part of the American dream, but we have to go back to this idea of what America, the United States was when it was founded. On the one hand, the United States is, was a country built on equality and freedom mm. and democracy and openness to immigrants 
And on the other side, the United States is a country built on genocide and slavery mm -hmm. and racism and, and oppression. So mm -hmm. these are the two, two faces of the United States represented by President Obama mm -hmm. and then by President Trump. Which is why when Amer some Americans were surprised by the election of President Trump, I wanted to ask, where have you been for the last 250 years of American history? You know, this has always been a part mm. of the United States. Uh, and so the, sim the sympathizer is, is definitely a, a, a novel that, that, that wants to demonstrate that, in fact, what the United States did in Vietnam was not an exception. Many Americans would like to say, you know, the, the war in Vietnam was an exception. We made a mistake. We don't normally do these kinds of things. But in fact, in American history, the United States has constantly done these kinds of things and has constantly forgotten that it has done these kinds of things and made excuses for itself mm -hmm. under the name of the American dream. Mm -hmm. And the refugees and immigrants fulfill this because ironically, many of the refugees mm -hmm. and immigrants who have come to the United States have come from countries that the United States has bombed mm -hmm. or occupied mm -hmm. or fought wars in. Mm -hmm. And then the United States has welcomed these refugees and immigrants and turned them into Americans so they could write their novels and their stories of the American dream, hmm. which makes everything okay for Yeah, Americans. exactly. To, to become part of the Hollywood narrative of uh, the Vietnam War, uh, for example. Uh, the, the narrative that is sort of saturating uh, global culture in many ways. Uh, I don't know, but maybe ironically there's, there's also a lot of Vietnamese people who sort of refer to Apocalypse Now or, or The Platoon rather than other stories about the Vietnam War. Um, I have a story like um, when I started African studies, uh, my professor, uh, he's from Senegal, he went to the bookstore in Dakar and he wanted to find out if there were any books about African studies. And there were, you know, meters and meters of, 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 of books, of course, but they were all written by French, British, British and American authors. And he said, like, where's my colleagues? Where, 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 where are my books? And uh, the bookkeeper was like... Uh, he, he was like, oh, yeah, there are some books. And then at the back of the store, he found those books next to the travel guides, you know, Lonely Planet and so on. And that's where the African authors of African studies were. So there's an, there's an interesting loss in, you know, in self in that situation. How is, is how's the situation in, in, in Vietnam in relation to, to the Vietnam War, would you say? Well, okay, so... <laughs> The Vietnamese won the Vietnam War. Well, some of the Vietnamese won the Vietnam War. Some mm. of the Vietnamese lost the Vietnam War. Mm. Um, but the irony, I, I think, the war was fought in the name of independence and freedom. That, that was Ho Chi Minh's famous slogan, nothing mm. is more precious than independence and freedom. And of course, the, the, the irony after the end of the Vietnam War is that Vietnam became a country that was not free for mm. so many of its people, which is an irony that is completely normal. Mm. This, is, this is true for many other revolutionary countries. Mm. Um, the, the, the revolutionaries win, and then they become the ones in control and, mm. and the ones in power, and they replicate the system of oppression on a new population. Mm. And so in Vietnam, there, there are constant reminders of the history of the war, the fact that the Vietnamese won this war. There are so many reminders of this, but they're also so boring that most of the Vietnamese people pay no attention mm. to these stories of the Vietnam War because they know they're just telling uh, one version of that of that past. Mm. And so ironically, American culture is popular in Vietnam uh, because it is popular everywhere. It is something that people can enjoy that doesn't have political, explicit political connotations. Mm. You brought mm. up Apocalypse Now. It's a movie that I think is a powerful movie, but which created deep ambivalence within me because to me it represents what I just talked about, mm. um, the complete silencing and erasure of Vietnamese stories mm. so that Americans can dramatize their own stories. Mm on top of that. But I met one Vietnamese filmmaker in the United States who had come to my university to study and he said, I love Apocalypse Now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's interesting. I think it's because for him, as someone from Vietnam, it was just a piece of, Amer of American culture he could walk away from because he had the rest of Vietnamese culture mm. to affirm who he was. But for those of us who grew up in the United States, we're Americans. And yet in this piece of American culture, we Vietnamese, that when we saw ourselves in, the, in, that, in, the, in that film, mm. were not just erased, but, but destroyed. Mm. And the irony of it is that the Vietnam War might be the first war in history where the losers get to write the history of the war <laughs> instead of the victors. Now, if you go to Vietnam, obviously it's the victors that write that history. But outside of Vietnam, 
in much of the rest of the world, it's the American story mm. that prevails, even among those people who don't like Americans. Mm. So I went to Italy, for example, was interviewed by a communist radio show host who was against American imperialism. But when Apocalypse Now came up, she said, I love Apocalypse Now. <laughs> and I was like, you realize, of course, that the very people that you supported, the Vietnamese people, have been silenced in Apocalypse Now. Sure. Yeah, think about it for a yeah. moment. But that's the power of American popular culture is that it can override even our political opposition to the United States. We might be opposed to American imperialism, but we'll still consume American culture. Mm. It's a very powerful move on the part of the United States. Yeah, I think also the, uh, this kind of tensions are played out on, on a personal level. Um, and for you, you, you were American raised in many ways. But then again, your parents were raised in Vietnam, right? And, and, and there must have been a, a tension of how, how do you uh, negotiate those uh, issues, right? With my parents? Yeah. Oh, there's no negotiation. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, I, okay, so I think, I think, I, I think the, the way that I negotiated with my parents oh. was not to talk to them. Um, so, for example, uh, I was very lucky in the sense that my parents, who are very conservative, were liberal in one respect, which is that they allowed me to choose my own educational path. Mm. You know, stereotypically, the, I, the expectation for someone like me is that I become a doctor, doctor right? right? A lawyer, maybe an engineer. <laughs> Um, fortunately, my brother became a doctor, so he took, he, <laughs> he took he, that he did, he role. Did it for me. That he took, burden. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then I became a uh, an English professor, mm. which my parents have no understanding of. Not very lucrative path. Of... Not very lucrative, but at least it's a doctorate. <laughs> so my parents said, "Okay, it's not a medical doctorate, but it's some kind of doctorate. It's okay." Uh, but, but we never talked about what I did. Mm. So I certainly never told them that I was going to become a writer. Mm. And so basically, for twenty to thirty years of my life, I had a whole separate life that my parents knew nothing about. Mm until the sympathizer came out. Mm. And then uh, my parents didn't know what to make of it, but they were proud of me that I had written a book. Mm. And then it won the Pulitzer Prize, and then all of a sudden they liked my, me more than my brother, which was amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's all you have to do to, to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. to solve, to solve so, the negotiation. Politifies everything forget, uh, forgiven. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you... you, you written about the melancholic tale of two generations. Uh, I mean, I think that's a very beautiful way of putting it. There's a, there's a gap between, between you in language and culture and emotion. This, this gap is it. So the Pulitzer Prize was basically the bridge that made you uh, sort of come across, would you say? Or how, how has the sort of, how has there been any other way of, of discussing uh, your heritage or, or uh, the, the, the ancestry, the, the Vietnamese ancestry in, in, in relation to the, the context of America? No, I don't think so. Mm. I, I think that, you know, I, I, Vietnamese culture is very um, uh, hierarchical. Mm. You know, the children are supposed to do what the parents say. Mm. And also we're Catholics and that's even more hierarchical. So you bring the two things together and the place of children in the family is to say nothing and just accept what the parents say. Mm. And that was obviously very difficult for me, for me growing up. Um, wanting to communicate with my parents and, and not being able to, and then also having opinions that were completely different than my parents. But when I say that you know, the negotiation is simply to not talk to my parents, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that with a lot of love because it's, it's not necessary, I don't think, for my parents to understand me. Why do, why do they need to understand me? You know, they've, from my perspective as an American, I want them to understand me, but from my perspective as a Vietnamese person, I think, my parents have sacrificed an enormous amount to come to the United States, to build their lives, to give me everything that I needed, if not what I wanted. And so my obligation to my parents is to make them happy. Mm. And uh, anything that doesn't make them happy, I don't need to trouble them with. So I, I'm actually okay with, with not having to argue with my parents. For example, my parents are devout Catholics. Mm. I'm an atheist. Mm. I do not go home and say, hello, mom and dad, I'm an atheist. Therefore, I will not go to church with you. I will not pray with you. In fact, I go home and I go to church with them. Mm. Uh, and I think that's, that's perfectly acceptable. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think that, that many of us who are Vietnamese or who, of, of the second generation, or, or you know, we, we do this for our parents. Mm. We, we swallow our, our, our objections <laughs> our, or our differences because we know everything mm. that our parents have sacrificed for mm. us. Yeah, and... and... One one illustration of this is also you changed your you you didn't change your name but your parents did. Mm. That was that was ironic. That was very ironic for me because you know we came to the United States and I I grew up with my parents telling me 
you are 100% Vietnamese. <laughs> yeah. okay. So then they became citizens, and I became a citizen along with them. And my parents changed their names. They adopted American names, Joseph and Linda. And they asked me, so do you want to change your name? I thought, you told me we're 100% Vietnamese. How am I supposed <laughs> yeah. to change my name? Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, I tried. I thought of different names for myself, and none of them worked, and I couldn't bring myself to change my name. Mm. Um, ironically, since I felt very American, but because my parents had given me this name, which is a very Vietnamese name, very patriotic name, very common name, um, it created some kind of, of, of psychic connection with me to Vietnamese culture and to Vietnam that I could never break from, mm. even, no matter how American mm. that I felt. And I think this was also part of what made me into a writer as well, my recognition that I could not change my name. Mm. And that uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to become a writer was not to have the United States change me, but to have me change the United States so that my name would be an American name. Mm. <laughs> yeah. To really write your story, right. yeah. And but you never—I mean, growing up in, in in America, you were never tempted uh, to to deny uh, your refugeehood. Of course, and I think it manifested itself in all kinds of small ways. Mm -hmm. You know, children can be mm -hmm. cruel. So growing up, of course, I heard all kinds mm -hmm. of anti-Vietnamese jokes and mm -hmm. insults from from classmates and, mm -hmm. and so on. And like many refugees and immigrants, I felt I felt a certain degree of shame. For, for being a refugee or an immigrant or Vietnamese. Um, but uh, that, that was something that I overcame mm. when, I, when I went to college. And I started to learn more about American history mm. and started to learn about these things like genocide and slavery and racism mm. and, and the things that have been done to uh, Asian immigrants throughout American history. And that allowed me, you know, one of the antidotes to shame is knowledge. Mm. is a knowledge that I, I should not be the one ashamed of who I am. You know, uh, the United States should be ashamed of some of the things that it has done. Mm. Uh, and that's the kind of work that I think I'm engaged in and that many of the, my, my, the people that I identify with as my fellow writers and activists mm. and scholars are engaged in is to, mm. to try to push the United States to fully embrace its contradictions mm. and its failures. We don't need to encourage the, the United States to embrace its successes because we do that all the time. Mm. Uh, but in order, uh, I think, to help the United States become a better country, we have to help the United States fully confront its history. Mm. Maybe it's time for, for us to, to hear an excerpt from, from uh, the refugees. Um, there's, this is a part from uh, the short story of Fatherland. And um, yeah, I just let you read the process. Uh, so this is the last story in the collection, and it was a story written after I'd been to Vietnam uh, several times. And I think uh, in order for me to write this story, I had to visit Vietnam several times in order for me to stop thinking of Vietnam as a place that was different. It's a story set in Vietnam from a Vietnamese perspective, so I had to see the country as if I was a Vietnamese person in which everything was normal. Right? And, the base, and what happens in this story is that the main character's name is Phuong, and her sister is coming back from the United States, also named Phuong as well. It was the most peculiar thing to do, or so everyone said on hearing the story of how Phuong's father had named his second set of children after his first. Phuong was the eldest of these younger children, and for all of her 23 years, she had believed that her father's other children were much more blessed. Evidence of their good fortune was written in the terse letters sent home annually by the mother of Fung's namesake, the first Mrs. Lee, who enumerated each of her children's accomplishments, height and weight in bullet points. Fung's namesake, for example, was seven years older, 15 centimeters taller, 20 kilos heavier, and from the record in the photographs included with the letters in possession of fairer, clearer skin, a thinner, straighter nose, and hair clothing, shoes, and makeup that only became ever more fashionable as she graduated from a private girls' school, then from an elite college, followed by medical school, and then a residency in Chicago. Mr. Lee had laminated each of the photographs to protect them from humidity and fingerprints, keeping them neatly stacked on a side table by the couch in the living room. The letters accompanying the photographs were the only communiques that Thung's family received about the children 
for over the course of some 27 years' absence. Fung's namesake and her two younger brothers had never written a word themselves. And so when the first such letter finally arrived, it was the cause of a great deal of excitement. The letter was addressed to Mr. Lee, who, as the plenipotentiary of the house, always took it upon himself to open the mail. He sat on the couch and slit open the envelope carefully, using one of the few relics from his past he had managed to keep, a silver letter opener with an ivory handle. Flanking him were Fung and her mother, while his teen, two teenage sons, Hai and Fuk, sat on the armrests and craned their necks to catch a glimpse of the words their father read out loud. The letter was even shorter than the ones written by the ex-wife, merely announcing that Fung's half-sister would be coming for a two-week vacation and that she hoped to stay with them. Vivian, Mrs. Lee said, reading the name signed at the bottom of the letter. Is she too good to use the name you gave her? But Fung knew instantly why her sister had taken upon herself a foreign name and whose name it must have been. Vivian Lee, star of Gone with the Wind, her father's favorite film, as he had once told her in passing. Fung had seen the film on a pirated videotape and was seduced immediately by the glamour, beauty, and sadness of Scarlett O'Hara, heroine and embodiment of a doomed South. Was it too much to suppose that the ruined Confederacy, with its tragic sense of itself, bore more than a passing similarity to her father's defeated Southern Republic and its resentful remnants? <laughs> Yeah, immediately to my mind springs the, 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 the thought that there is also a huge pressure to be authentic towards the Vietnamese here. I mean, there, when, when uh, she has to, she can't just, you know, change her name like that. I mean, a lot of parents would, would perhaps be surprised if their children changed the names after, an, you know, a huge epic American movie. But anyway, um, there's, a, there's a demand from the parents, and um, to my mind springs this this is a slightly derogatory term or that, that was used I remember in South Africa called coconut that you you know you're black on the outside but you're white on the inside and and I, I guess in 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 the black American community there's like the Oreo um, and this feels like there's a, some something similar that like you you're not real you're not authentic. This this sort of demand must be. Uh, th this is is very interesting. Could you, could you elaborate on 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 that? Well, for Asian Asian Americans in the United States, it's not the Oreo or the coconut. It's the banana. Mm, exactly. Okay, it's yeah. a banana. Um, and so I was a banana growing up. You know, um, I I came in 1975, and at that time, all of, almost all the Vietnamese refugees who came were fluent in Vietnamese, and you know, they hung on to their Vietnamese culture. And I was sort of different from many other Vietnamese people because I guess I wanted to be an American. I was fully fluent in, in English. I, 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 my, my Vietnamese was fluent as well for a four-year-old and stayed that way for the next 20, <laughs> 20 years. And so other Vietnamese people would look at me and say, you're a banana. You, you've become completely assimilated or whitewashed. And uh, that always angered me because even at that very young age, I had, I had intuitive understanding that authenticity was a problem because it's great if you're authentic, but what about all the people that you call inauthentic? And I thought, uh, why do we define Vietnamese culture in a very particular way? Shouldn't Vietnamese culture be inclusive of all the different kinds of people that are out there? Uh, and, and authenticity is something that we impose upon minorities and that minorities impose upon themselves. Mm. But if you're Americans, for example, there is no authenticity. Here's the norm. Every, you're American. There's like millions of different Americans out there. Uh, but again, because you're a minority, you feel a, a, a deep need to hang on to your culture and define it very narrowly, which is why when I, was, when I went to college, for example, we, there, there are a lot of Vietnamese college students in the United States. And in almost every college campus where you find them, they would stage every year a Vietnamese culture show hmm. where the students would dress up in traditional Vietnamese gear, uh, clothing, sing traditional Vietnamese songs, uh, do traditional Vietnamese dances. And I thought, this is silly. 
because Americans do not go around doing American culture shows. They don't have to mm -hmm. because everything is American culture. Mm -hmm. But because we felt vulnerable about uh, what our culture was in the United States, we created these culture shows that said Vietnamese culture is this, mm -hmm. as if Vietnamese culture never changed. But then when I went back to Vietnam, what did I discover? You're an American. Uh, not, not, only, not only that I'm an American, <laughs> but that the Vietnamese people in Vietnam didn't do any of these things. Uh -huh. The Vietnamese people in Vietnam, I was like, they drive Lamborghinis in the streets? Why is that not a part of our culture mm. show mm. in the United States? Mm. Mm. And so this is part of the weird uh, issue of authenticity, mm. that if you're an immigrant or a refugee, what's very common is that you take your culture that you brought with you and you freeze it, and you put it in the freezer mm. so that it never changes. Mm. So that's why when Vietnamese refugees go back to Vietnam, people know right away who they are. Because they speak Vietnamese from 1975. The language never changed. Right? And meanwhile, the people in Vietnam have, have changed. They, they do all kinds of different things. They've become capitalists. They wear the latest fashion. And so culture in Vietnam itself is not authentic. Culture, like culture here constantly changes. But again, when you're an immigrant or a refugee, you, you do not want to confront the mm. fact that culture has changed. You want to yeah. hang on to it and define it very clearly. Yeah. And, and, and you're not allowed to sort of enjoy the, the liberal privileges of having various roles in, the, in the, that way. Um, I, have a, I have a story for you. I met the, the, the writer Alain Mabancou from Congo Brazzaville, and he, he, he said that in France, he's, uh, he's an African from the colonized Francophonie. Uh, but then he moved to, to a university and started teaching in, in, in the States. And uh, in, in the States, everyone viewed him as French. I mean, he's like, no, you're French. But then he said, no, hey, hold on, no, I, like, I'm, I'm not French. I don't want to be French. I'm, I'm from, I'm from, I'm Congolese, you know. Then all of a sudden, he was very aware of being Congolese. So he said, no, I'm, I'm from Congo, Brazil. Uh, and then the students said, oh, you're from Africa, you know. So, <laughs> so you're from Africa. So they wanted to, you know, talk about roots all of a sudden, you know, what, the roots, the African roots, and the Zulu nation, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, so his identity was all, all the time sliding back and forth like that. And then he said, like, well, I have to disappoint you, but if you go to Lagos or, or to, to you know, one of the major cities in, 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 in African nations, uh, you will see skyscrapers, you know. There will be no javelins or, or shields and stuff. Uh, but... But he, he, he had to all, all the time sort of adjust his identity towards other people like that. Do you, do you sort of feel like you have to represent Vietnam or be an expert on Vietnam uh, as, as coming as a, as a Vietnamese American? I think in person, in conversation, yes, because I'm a very nice, polite person. So if you ask me to explain something about Vietnamese culture, I will do it. But as an author, no. Mm. As an author, no. So. Um, I don't know how it works here in Sweden, but in the United States, if you are a so-called minority and you become a writer, mm. oftentimes the expectation put upon you is that you become a translator, an interpreter of your culture, whatever that is, to the rest of the United States. So you do, in fact, are, you know, are encouraged to explain things in your, in your writing. But if you're a part of the majority, you never have to translate or explain mm. because you assume that everyone knows what you're talking about. And so when I became a writer, I decided I am not going to translate. I'm not going to explain because if I do so, it's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of my writing already being deformed. And my challenge would be not to renounce being Vietnamese or being a minority, but to embrace those things while writing as if I am a part of the majority, to write as if I were a writer like every other writer and force my readers to come to my work and accept that, they're, that they will have to learn something in order to understand what I'm writing about mm. and that they should not expect translation or, or explanation. Mm. So that, was, that, that for me was a very crucial decision that I had to make. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, you, you always start with your own personal experience, but then you try to, I guess, always sort of push the border of personal experience. Um, in order to write fiction, but then, um, well, how, how did you react to uh, 
the 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 issues that that Lionel Shriver, you know, in the Brisbane 2016 Writers Festival raised when she said like uh, cultural appropriation threatens to extinguish literature. What, what what was your reaction? Because she was in in a blunt way, in an arrogant way, perhaps um, addressing the issues of authenticity and and fiction. Well, I think there's two issues here, mm -hmm. you know, and one issue is can a writer write about anything that he or she wants to write about? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, and I reserve that right because I want to write about everything as well. But should a writer do his or her research before doing that? And I think, yes, mm -hmm. you should. Now, I think I felt qualified to write a novel about Americans mm -hmm. because I've spent my entire life living among Americans. I know what I'm talking about. But there are a certain number of writers who simply want to write about different cultures and not, mm -hmm. not do the work. And if they get things wrong, they get upset that mm -hmm. their artistic freedom has been, has been criticized. Mm -hmm. When really, what, the only thing that we're criticizing is not artistic freedom. We're criticizing stupidity on the part of the writer. But the other issue that underlies all of this is uh, the, 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 the fact that appropriation is not just about culture. It's about power. Mm. and about economics. Mm. And, and the fact is that I think um, minorities get very upset when they feel that their culture has been appropriated by someone else because it triggers for them the whole sense of their entire history, mm. which be, has been a history of being appropriated and colonized. Mm. Uh, so, you know, for example, African-American, so for example, since I've been here in Sweden, I've heard a lot of African-American music everywhere. Uh, and so African-American music has become uh, a completely a part of American culture and therefore exported globally. Americans identify completely with African-American music, and yet America is a deeply racist, unequal country. Mm -hmm. That is the level of appropriation that we're really talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. People are not getting upset simply because a white person is writing about a black person. It's that when they do it badly, it mm -hmm. points to this entire history that has not yet been solved mm -hmm. of, of how appropriation has real economic and personal consequences still for so many people. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to The Sympathizer for a moment. Um, it's an it's a, it's a excellent novel. I mean, you must read it. It's, it's, it's a spy novel. It's a political novel. It's, um, it's also a novel that is, I mean, hilariously funny in many ways, but I would say also when I, when I read it, it um, the, sort of the underpinning, or the 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 the, the s s sort of a stream, a current in in the book is one of rage. I would say I I I, I sort of thought more about you know authors like James Baldwin or Tanihisi Coates or uh, Toni Morrison, uh, who use irony and, and 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 you know comic effects like that. But there's an underlying rage. Would you agree? Oh yes, absolutely. Right. Rage, rage can be very good, uh, especially in writing. Not, you know, I'm not advocating that people go out in the streets and commit violence, but violence in literature can be a very good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I wrote the refugees first. Actually, mm -hmm. this, the, the the refugees was how I learned how to write, and it took me <laughs> 20 years. I think you asked me at the beginning how was it like to write the refugees. All I can say is I hated every minute of writing the refugees because it was so hard. Uh, th that will not be your experience reading it. Your experience will be one of pleasure as you read The Refugees. It won't take very long. Um, but my experience with that was very arduous. And part of what was happening in The Refugees was that I wanted to be, not, I wouldn't say authentic, but I wanted to represent Vietnamese stories. I felt that you know we had been erased, as I mentioned, and that there were so many important stories to tell. That was my first ambition, to, 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 to you know, serve Vietnamese people. After I did that, I thought, I don't have to do that again. Mm. I can write a book like The Sympathizer, where I can stop being polite, mm. where I don't have to serve my Vietnamese community, where I don't have to cater to larger American expectations, and I can give vent to the rage and the anger that I have felt for mm. a long time. Mm. But it's not directed only at Americans. In fact, this book is designed to offend everybody. <laughs> 
And uh, it, it, you know, for example, the I book wasn't has, defended. Yeah, well, you're, you're, well, you're you're not American or Vietnamese. <laughs> so that's what I mean. But but I mean, it, it's been censored. It's been you know, it's not allowed to be published in Vietnam, for example. It's upset a good number of uh, of Americans. Um, but it's also upset Vietnamese Americans, mm. my people, mm. my people who would not be offended by the refugees. Many of them are offended by the sympathizer. Why is that? Mm. Because I wrote it from the perspective of a communist spy. And for the Vietnamese refugees who came to the United States, they are deeply anti-communist. They, they want to have nothing to do with communism. So how can a Vietnamese American writer write from the perspective of a communist spy? And so when I made that decision, I knew that it would cost me a lot of uh, Vietnamese American readers. And the reason, but the reason I did it was because I think the role of a writer in relationship to a community is not to tell the community what it wants to hear. The role of the writer is to tell the community what it needs to hear. And so for the Vietnamese American community, one of the things that it needs to hear is that communists are human beings too. Hmm. For Americans, one of the things that Americans need to hear is that the United States is an imperialist country that has waged devastating wars all over the globe, including in hmm. Vietnam. Hmm. And so that's why I think the book offends a lot of people because it says things that, that people do not want to acknowledge. Mm. And when they don't want to acknowledge something, they will refuse to hear the rest of what you have to say. Mm. So for example, um, after this book came out, an American veteran of the Vietnam War wrote mm. me a, lo a long letter. I get a lot of these long letters. And he said, uh, you know, you, you must, uh, you seem to hate America. Mm. Why don't you go back to Vietnam, since you seem to love communism so much, and take your son with you? And I thought this person didn't read beyond the first third of the novel. Mm -hmm. The first third of the novel has a lot of very critical things to say about the United States. Mm -hmm. But the last third of the novel has a lot of very critical things to say about Vietnamese communism. Mm -hmm. But because he couldn't get over the truth that I presented to him in the first third, he couldn't get to the truth in the last third. Right. Now, the book is not anti-American. The book is, no. is critical of the abuses of power and, 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 uh, and hypocrisy, mm. no matter where we find it, no matter who are the people doing these terrible things. Mm. Why well, is it called the sympathizer? I mean, maybe we could, we could explain that just for, for clarity's sake. Well, the opening line of the novel is, I'm a spy, a sleeper, a spook, a man of two faces. Perhaps not surprisingly, I'm also a man of two minds. So he's a spy in his one talent, as he, as he goes on to tell us, is that he can sympathize with anybody. Mm. And actually, the, the stronger word is probably empathize. He can inhabit other people's perspectives. But the empathizer makes for a terrible title, so it had to be the sympathizer. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, I mean, part of the reason why I created the, this character is that this book is about mm. the Vietnam War, which obviously was a completely divisive war. People felt they had to take one side or the other. Mm. And the Vietnam War was simply one manifestation of the so-called Cold War, which, again, one side or the other. And in order to confront that kind of system where you had to choose, you know, sympathy or empathy are necessary. You have, to, you have to see from other people's points of view if you want to be able to reconcile with them or, or make peace with them. Now, you need more than that in order to achieve peace or reconciliation. And the, the tragedy of this novel is that as talented as our spy is, as sympathetic as he can be, sympathy alone is not going to be enough for him to solve the situations that he finds himself in. Hmm. Did you have fun writing oh, the... I loved writing it. I loved writing this yeah, novel. You, you can feel that in the prose almost. Yeah. It's like, it has a super drive to yeah. it in, in that way. Well, you know, I think with the refugees, uh, I, I felt... Um, I mean, I, I, I enjoy the stories, but I also felt that um, I was being polite in them mm. as well. Mm. And with the, the Sympathizer was a very impolite novel. And it was me deciding that I will, will, will say everything that I feel inside of me. So it was mm. actually very liberating to mm. do so. And it was two years of me sitting at the computer, oftentimes laughing to myself, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as I finally was able to express <laughs> everything that I felt. Laughing uh, about how you would... Uh, create controversy and offend <laughs> your community and other communities. Yeah. All right. I, um, maybe you could read um, a short uh, excerpt from, from uh, the refugees. Um, 
it's from uh, a novel called War Years, and uh, I think uh, it's it's a woman, the mother of the protagonist, who is um, standing in her shop, grocery store, okay. so and what... has to deal with with exactly this kind of layered, <laughs> this masks right. basically. So War Years is the only autobiographical short story I've ever written, and um, you know I, I mentioned that I grew up in San Jose, California. My parents owned a, the, the second Vietnamese grocery store in San Jose, in downtown San Jose, um, at a time when Vietnamese, no one, no one except Vietnamese refugees wanted to open businesses there. And so this, this story is set in that store of the 1980s. And um, uh, it's based on a true incident that my mother told me about, which is that one time uh, a woman came, a Vietnamese woman came to the store asking for money mm. in order to help pay for the anti-communist cause among the Vietnamese. I mean, there really was a movement in the 1980s for Vietnamese refugees to form an army to go back and take Vietnam. And so everything else after that, I imagined. My mother and father rarely left their posts, the cash registers flanking the entrance of the new Saigon market. Customers always crowded the market, one of the few places in San Jose where the Vietnamese could buy the staples and spices of home. Jasmine rice and star anise, fish sauce and fire engine red chilies. People haggled endlessly with my mother over everything, beginning with the rock sugar, which I pretended was yellow kryptonite, and ending with the varieties of meat in the freezer, from pork chops and catfish with a glint of light in their eyes to shoestrings of chewy tripe and packets of chicken hearts, small and tender as button mushrooms. Can't we just sell TV dinners, I asked once. It was easy to say TV dinners in Vietnamese since the word for television was TV, but there were no Vietnamese words for other things I wanted. And what about bologna? What? My mother's brow furrowed. If I can't pronounce it, my customers won't buy it. Now go stamp the prices on those cans. They're just going to ask for a lower price. I was 13, beginning to be brave enough to say what I had suspected for a while, that my mother wasn't always right. Why do they haggle over everything? Why can't they just pay the price that's there? Are you going to be the kind of person who always pays the asking price, my mother demanded, or the kind who fights to find out what something's really worth? <laughs> I wasn't sure. All I knew was that in the new Saigon, my chore every afternoon was to price the cans and packages. I was on my knees rummaging for the stamp pad on the shelf behind my mother when Mrs. Hua introduced herself. Like my mother, she was in her late 40s and dressed in monochrome, a white jacket, white pants, and white shoes with bug-eyed sunglasses obscuring her face. As my mother bagged her purchases, Mrs. Hua said, I'm collecting funds for the fight against the communists, my dear. I knew the basics of our history as well as I knew the story of Adam and Eve. The communists had marched from North Vietnam in 1975 to invade South Vietnam, driving us out all the way across the Pacific to California. I had no memories of the war, but Mrs. Hua said others had not forgotten. A guerrilla army of former South Vietnamese soldiers was training in the jungles of Thailand, preparing to launch a counterattack in unified Vietnam. The plan was to stir the unhappy people against their communist rulers, incite a, res a revolution, and resurrect the Republic of the South. Our men need our support, Mrs. Hua said, and we need good citizens like yourself to contribute. My mother rubbed one ankle against the other, her nylons scratching. A seam had opened behind her knee, but my mother would keep wearing the same hose until the run nipped at her heels. I wish I could help, Mrs. Hua, but times are hard, my mother said. Our customers are cutting back on everything, what with the recession and gas prices, and our daughters in college. Her tuition is like a down payment on a house every year. I struggle making ends meet, too. Mrs. Hua unclasped and clasped the silver latch on her purse. A thin gold band encircled her ring finger, and the red enamel on her nails was as polished and glossy as a new car's paint. But people talk. Did you hear about Mrs. Bin? 
People say she's a communist sympathizer, and all because she's too cheap to give anything. There's even talk of boycotting her store. My mother knew Mrs. Bin, owner of Les Amis Beauty Salon a few blocks farther west downtown, but changed the topic to the steamy June weather and the price of gold. Mrs. Hua agreed about the temperature, smiling and displaying a wall of formidable teeth. She glanced at me before leaving my mother with this. Think about it, dear. Taking back our homeland is a noble cause for which we should all be proud to fight. Idiot, my mother muttered after Mrs. Hua was gone. <laughs> yeah, you, you've written somewhere, I might misquote you now, but that there are two wars going on uh, in the battlefields and then in the memory, uh, obviously also in the grocery stores. And I mean, in the memory, the memories are, as you said, it's, they, they, they're slowly by time separating themselves from, from realities in, in Vietnam. Um, did this, this movement in, 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 in the Vietnamese American community, was it, how was it the strong one that sort of after a while just had a reality check and uh, and, and and sort of faded away or or is there still people who who believe that that there will be a huge change someday well the line is from my book nothing ever dies and it's um, all wars are fought twice the first mm -hmm. time on the battlefield the second time in memory mm -hmm. and growing up in you know in this refugee community in the united states in the 1970s and 1980s i think that's where i got my sense that this Vietnam War had never ended. It certainly never ended for the Vietnamese refugees who were constantly fighting the war again uh, in their community. You would, you would still see former soldiers dressed in uniforms. People would still wave the, the South Vietnamese flag. We would sing the South Vietnamese anthem at every gathering of the community. Mm -hmm. And I really, you know, I did see um, exhibits at community festivals raising money for these soldiers in. Thailand. And then I was also growing up in the United States watching all the, I watched almost every single movie that Hollywood made about the Vietnam War, which is an exercise I recommend to nobody. Uh, you probably have seen one or two of these movies and they're all the same. And so Americans also, because they lost the war, uh, had never gotten over it. And if I look at American history, I think, you know, we fought the, the Civil War uh, 150 years ago, and we're still not over it as a country. Many of the, the problems and the divisions in the, in the United States are still rooted in that history. Mm -hmm. And so this gave me the sense that uh, part of the work that I wanted to do as a writer was to fight this war in memory too, but mm -hmm. from a completely different perspective. And going back to your, to your question, um, the, 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 the people who felt that they had lost everything, the Vietnamese soldiers and, and uh, government officials and their families were very, very bitter, mm. very angry. And they were still young men, mm. still capable of imagining that they could fight a war again. Mm. And so they really did. I mean, there really was a, a, a small army there. They really sent soldiers through Thailand into Laos mm. to try to invade <laughs> Vietnam, and it met with disaster. <laughs> They were all wiped, they were all killed or captured and, and sent mm. to prison. And so in The Sympathizer, I took that episode and I turned it into the basis of mm. the novel. Mm. But eventually what happened? Uh, eventually what happened was everybody got old. You know, you can be bitter, but if you're 70 years old, you can't fight a war anymore. Mm. Um, they, they, they never became reconciled to, to, to communist Vietnam. But what, what happened? They, they, their children became reconciled to communist Vietnam. Their children went back to Vietnam to visit the country again. Their children, who had been taken away by their parents fleeing a communist country for better opportunities in the United States, some of these children went back to Vietnam to open restaurants in communist Vietnam or to become actors and movie directors in communist Vietnam. So the, the tide of history has turned against them. Mm -hmm. And armed revolution against Vietnam is not possible. Mm -hmm. So in, instead, they, 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 they protest, reasonably so, I think, for, for human rights, for, for greater democracy in Vietnam. Because again, one of the ironies of, of communist Vietnam is that it's a very repressive mm -hmm. country. 
And it's a country that, although independent, is also completely capitalist. And so the reconciliation that has taken place after the war between the United States and Vietnam has been a reconciliation of capitalist countries who are interested in negotiating with each other in order to fight against China. Hmm. You know, hmm. now the, the 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 Vietnamese may have ambivalent feelings about the French for having colonized them and the Americans for having been in the country, but what's what unites all Vietnamese people is that we really don't like the Chinese. And so that's th th those have become the power politics that have trumped everything hmm. in in the in, in in the contemporary moment. And the trouble with that, from the point of view of reconciliation, and it's something that I think you know, is a lesson to be carried into many different situations, is that neither the United States nor Vietnam has really addressed the history of what has happened, the atrocities that were committed by all sides, the inequality that led to revolution in the first place, and which is still there in communist mm -hmm. Vietnam. So the reconciliation of capitalism in Vietnam with the United States is really a reconciliation that empowers the elite and the wealthy and the middle class. But most of Vietnam is still poor, is still rural. A lot of Vietnam is still unequal. And so long as these issues are not addressed, the history will come back to the surface just mm -hmm. as it continues to come back to the surface in the United States. Yeah, and, and, and I guess without being too idealistic, but your book is, is a part of, of something that is perhaps able to translate into political action and, and, and to, to at least give voice to, to Know, an alternative or different narrative that sort of opens up to, to another truth. Um, I'm thinking also of, a, of a, this situation in a way, perhaps ironically, uh, lessens the generational gap between uh, in, in the community. But is there like an, a, a group identity that actually can be translated into political action. I mean, because there is a fight going on uh, at home in in in, in the states uh, with the xenophobic tendencies uh, that are now in 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 the states in Europe, but also um, in the Trump adm administration very clearly. Um, so how how can Asian Americans or Vietnamese American communities specifically? Uh, give themselves a voice and, and translate sort of uh, this, their lives into political action that actually actually defends them? Well, okay, so I think there's two dimensions to, to answering your question. One mm -hmm. is the, the question of how do we tell stories, which is what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. And the other question is how do we translate stories into action, which I'm not very good at. Okay, but I, 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 I truly believe that storytelling matters greatly. Certainly, it matters for all of us who believe in literature as readers and as writers. Right? Trump is a great storyteller. And I go around saying Trump is an incredible storyteller. Make America Great Again yeah. is an incredible story that has persuaded Good 30 versus to 40 evil, percent. Yes. All that. And it, it taps into mm. these subterranean levels of emotion and feeling within a, a good portion of the American population. That's what a good story does. Now, it may be a story that I completely disagree with, but it works for mm. his audience. So political change and mobilization only happens with a good story. Uh, in Vietnam, the good story was Ho Chi Minh's slogan, nothing is more precious than independence and freedom. And that persuaded a very large part of the Vietnamese population to follow him and the, and the communist revolution. And then the second step, though, is how do you take a good story and translate it into action? How do you mobilize people? How do you organize people? And in fact, you mentioned Asian Americans, and I, uh, you know, growing up in the United States, um, knew that I was different as a refugee and as a Vietnamese person, but I had no, no language to put that into words. So I remember I went to a mostly white high school in California, and there were a handful of us of Asian descent. We knew we were different, we didn't know how. So every day at lunch, we would gather in a corner of the campus, and we would call ourselves the Asian Invasion. <laughs> That's a racist idea, but it's the only language we had for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. then I went to college at University of California at Berkeley, and there was a new story waiting for me there called the Asian American Movement, which had come out of the radical movements of the 1960s against racism, against the Vietnam War. That was an example, I think, of how mm. words and stories can completely transform our perception of the world, at least it did for me. Mm. 
because I could suddenly see myself in a completely new way through this story. And that's one of the reasons why I became a writer and became an activist. I could see that storytelling and, and, and writing fiction could be connected to this whole idea of a movement of people fighting for their rights and their visibility in the United States. Mm. And while that may be different in every country, the, the principle is the same. You need a story and you need action. And this is the great power and the great drawback of literature. You know, literature gives us stories, makes us feel things for people we may never see, uh, creates empathy in us for people who need justice, for example, one thing that literature does. But literature can't make us do anything. And so that's literature's great power and literature's great limit, that it can make us feel greatly, make us see the world in new ways. But if we don't do anything, then we've all of a sudden allowed ourselves to be stopped mm. at simply listening to a story. Mm. And so the next step has to be to go out there to mobilize people, to become a part of a political organization. I'll, I do mm. these kinds of things too, to try to build many, many, many movements that add up to the larger movement to make change happen. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's really valuable uh, contributions you do, giving voice also to and platforms to to refugees and, and refugee writers and, and, and with their short stories and, and also uh, with your op-eds in New York Times and LA Times. Let me just say one thing about that, which is that um, I have a voice and I speak a lot and I write a lot, but I'm not a voice for the voiceless. Mm. You know, uh, the, the novelist Erin Dati Roy has a very succinct way of putting this. And she says that uh, people are not voiceless they speak all the time. It's simply that they're not heard. Exactly. Right? And that speaks to, again, one of the, one of the, you, you spoke about cultural appropriation before. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the things that people who talk about cultural appropriation don't understand is that storytelling is not only about stories. Mm -hmm. It's not only about books. Mm -hmm. And storytelling is also about who gets their voices heard, who gets their books published, who gets their stories uh, made available. And in every country, at least in the United States, publishing, for example, is, is capitalism. Mm. And as capitalism, it incorporates all of the inequalities that are spread throughout American society. So in fact, uh, publishing will publish voices for the voiceless like me, and yet American society will remain unequal. And so the voice for the voiceless, the author whose story you read and you feel good about becomes an excuse mm. for not doing anything mm. to address the very conditions that the author is talking about. Mm. And so that's why it's, it's absolutely crucial that anybody who is called a voice for the voiceless must say, no, I'm not. Because if you say you're a voice for the voiceless, you're participating in the very system of mm. inequality mm. that gives you the opportunity to speak about, that, that for you to speak about. And it must be our task both to speak, but also to dismantle the system that creates a need for the voice for the voiceless in the first place. I think that are beautiful and strong final words of this conversation. It's been Thank you so pleasure much for your, talking for this to conversation. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for being here. Two brilliant minds in a brilliant conversation. Thank you, Viet, and thank you, Andreas. But you have to. I mentioned Uppsala University. How come you're heading to Uppsala after the book signing session? Please tell the audience. Uh, that's very embarrassing. Thank you. I'm receiving an honorary doctorate from Uppsala University uh, on Friday. Thank you. Some of you know about this particular gift. We, we like to encourage the so-called analog world. And sometimes you receive an ordinary letter, perhaps. This is a letter opener in the shape of an alligator. Are you checking in your luggage? Uh, yes, Please I am. Do. Please okay. do. <laughs> Thank you so much. You so it's much. been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And a gift for you, Andreas. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. And there's another one here. And I think, I think this one belongs to a person representing your excellent Swedish publishing house, Johannes. 
Please. So, I will I will ask our guest of honor to 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 stay on stage, and you are most welcome to approach him. And there will be a short book signing session, and uh, see you some other time. And I have to say, and I can say this in, in Swedish now. Ni måste komma den 6 februari till under fontänen på lilla lokal under fontänen på Sägerstorg. Där möter ni den irakiske författaren Ahmed Sadawi. Han bor fortfarande i, i Bagdad. Han kommer att prata med um, Athena Faroxad. De pratar både på arabiska och svenska. Och hans bok som bygger på Mary Shelley's klassiker Frankenstein. Som har den svenska titeln Frankenstein i Bagdad. Ska ni också läsa. Ännu en av världens författare. Tack för ikväll. Det var så great. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for having me in this, this lovely venue and for this gift as well. Yeah. It was a real pleasure. <laughs>